ministry. So we are doing a study called Marvel, and if you'd like to open up your book, or your books, open up your Bible to the book of Judges chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one in back. Uh, but Judges chapter 4, and a couple of things have been mentioned, but I want to kind of highlight a little bit more some things we have going on. First of all, uh, Salzman's great job on, on, on raising Gabriel. Uh, he said, hey, it's my birthday today. And he's, I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, and I get to worship Jesus on my birthday. So that's pretty exciting. Okay. Everybody, aw, that was cute, wasn't it? Okay. Uh, we are next Sunday. We know we'll have several people out of town with the camping trip. We're okay with that. I have no problem with you going and spending time together as a family up in the mountains with God. Uh, so we'll probably have a smaller group. So we're going to spend to next Sunday. Our entire focus is going to be on the Lord's Supper. Um, and we are going to, we'll have a time where we are quiet and we, we spend some time doing some self-reflecting. But we'll also have some time where we are in community with each other for our Lord's Supper next week. So we invite you to be here. If you're not up in the mountains, come join us for what I think is the most important thing that happens every Sunday morning, and that's the Lord's Supper. Uh, Everyday Heroes, thank you so much for sharing, and we want to give you guys a few more chances. Uh, If there's anybody alive or not alive that lives here or doesn't live here, that you say, man, this person has been a hero in my life. Man, we want to do what the Bible says and give honor where honor is due, and for you to get up and share those stories. And part of this is we're wanting not only to bless people, but just for us to get this idea that you don't have to have superpowers to be a hero, okay? Uh, we can all be heroes. Uh, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to be able to breathe underwater to be a hero. You don't have to be an alien. You don't have to wear spandex. Amen, thank you, Jesus, okay? You can be a regular person, and just by the way you treat others and love and serve others, you can be a hero to them. And so with that in mind, we, uh, we do have that challenge in our bulletin that uh, we, I think we have three more weeks to, before we finish this series up. We want to encourage you to find a friend or a family um, uh, or maybe a neighbor and some way between now and then to think of a way to serve them and bless them. Uh, I want you guys to understand, we aren't putting these things out here to say, if you want God to love you, you have to do these things. That isn't the purpose of giving you guys these opportunities, these challenges. It's I grew up, for me, I grew up in a church where we would constantly sit and hear a great lesson on serving, or a great lesson on evangelism, or a great lesson on prayer. And then we would finish that series and move on to the next great series. And there were never opportunities to put what we had been learning into action. And so these are just opportunities for you guys to say, oh, maybe we could do this to bless somebody. Uh, If you are willing to bless somebody else and serve them, we want for you to let us know about that. And we are going to share with the congregation, but it's going to be incognito. We're not going to use your name. We're not here to bring glory to you. We are here just as a congregation to start hearing and understanding, oh, we're serving in this, in this church. That's becoming part of who our community is, that we serve our neighbors. We serve our friends throughout the week. And so please let us know the ways you're serving, not just so that we can honor you, but so that God can be honored. A couple of ways you can do that. You may be like, I don't have any friends or families or neighbors. I can't think of anybody to serve, okay? Well, uh, the, uh, the, the Hermio family would love uh, for you guys to serve them this week. They have, I know that they have lots of medical problems and lots of different hurts and pains going on in their life, but this past week was rough. Uh, Dolores has been getting over pneumonia. They had to take Gibran into the hospital. He had 106 fever. He had to spend the night in the hospital. Both the other boys were at home sick. They don't have pneumonia. They had something else because, well, why not? And then uh, even Ruth Rudy ended up hurting his thumb or one of his fingers this last week at work. So it's kind of, it's all hitting them this week. And so please reach out to them, cook them a meal. If nothing else, just send them a text, send them an email, give them a call. It'll mean the world to them. Another way you could be serving is we are trying to do uh, care, homeless care packages. We're inviting you guys to buy these things, bring these things to the church. We're going to put them in bags and then we're going to give them to you. And so maybe a good thing you could do for your neighbor is maybe go to your neighbor's house and say, hey, do you want to go shopping with me? We're, we're doing this homeless pa- care package thing. And, and maybe you go shopping with some family or some younger people that, that maybe you want to mentor. Spend some time with other people and figure out a way to have community as we serve others. So just a couple of random ideas for, for you guys to be serving in different ways. Okay, so Marvel. Well, I'm excited about uh, this morning's uh, superhero as we go through it. It is Wonder Woman. Okay? Now, Wonder Woman, I don't know what kind of Wonder Woman you grew up with, all right? But uh, the original Wonder Woman came out back in 1941. 
And the, the gentleman who created her, he actually, he, he had this idea that he said, I want to create a superhero. It was kind of all dominated by men in the comic books back then. And he said, I want to create a superhero that instead of just immediately always fighting or always using violence to fight the bad guys, that first they try to use understanding. They try to use love to work the problem out. And when he told his wife he wanted to make a superhero like this, she said, well, it has to be a woman then. Because all you men, you're just, it's always first, here's a problem, here's a hammer, let's fix it, okay? And so he decided he was going to create Wonder Woman. Uh, Wonder Woman, her name is uh, Princess Diana, and she's a warrior princess from the Amazons, okay? Uh, part of her story is that her, 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 uh, her, Foremothers, foremothers, her forefathers, foremothers is like a thing, I guess, okay. Uh, her her, her great-great-grandmothers, uh, they, they were actually in with, the, uh, with uh, the warriors from Greece, but they became so overwhelmed with the violence and the evil of the men in Greece, they decided to separate themselves and start their own little community where the, the sins and the violence of men couldn't come into their community. Uh, when, I, when I was, I know it sounds funny, when I was studying this comic book character for my sermon, uh, I had a flashback to a friend of mine who, uh, he is a Christian slash bull in a china closet. Uh, he was, uh, one day he was at a restaurant in his little town, and a family of about 12 different people came in. Three or four different families came in and sat down and were eating, and he thought, I'm in a small town, I've never seen these people before, I need to meet them. He went over to meet them, and he started talking to them, and it turned out these were three or four families who they had moved away from their towns. They had moved out to the small town and they were buying land way out where they were going to start their own little community where they would homeschool and they would have church and they would do everything out there away from all the evils of the world. And this friend of mine didn't think that was a good idea. So he let them know, you know what you're doing is the exact opposite of what Christ has told you to do. He didn't tell you to retreat. He said, go into all the world. He ended up getting into an argument with these people in the restaurant, and I think he got kicked out of the restaurant. I'm not saying that's a good idea. It just reminded me of that, that whole story. So they had gotten away from the evil deeds of men, but Diana, as a young woman, she has heard about World War II going on in the outside world. And she has heard about all the evil deeds of the Nazis, and so she requests of her mother the queen, can I please leave the safety of this place and go help and make a difference in the middle of the war? What a beautiful four-story pre-story. So some of her powers, if you guys, well, let me just ask, how many of you guys, if you've ever seen a Wonder Woman or you're watching Wonder Woman, yell out, what's one, of the, what's one of the tools she has or one of the powers she has? Lasso, the lasso, this is amazing. The guy that created her, his name is William Moulton Martston. That's a weird name. He was a psychologist. And here's the cool thing about the lasso. You use the lasso and you throw it on somebody and they have to tell the, the truth. They can't lie. Guess what this guy also created? He created the polygraph machine. Kind of neat, okay? Some of, what are some of her other tools or other weapons that she has to, to fight? Okay, she has her bing, 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 those really big bracelets, all right? She's got a really cool shield. Is that the noise it makes? Bing, bing, bing. Okay, when bullets hit her, okay? She has a sword. I didn't know this. She has a tiara that uh, the old ones on TV, I don't remember that girl's name, but uh, back in the 80s, she could take the tiara off and use it like a, a boomerang and knock guys out and they go right back on her head, okay? And she would look fashionable the whole time, all right? Those are some of the powers she has. Now, something else that I thought was really interesting, it's kind of fun learning the backstory of great heroes, is this, is that she was motivated out of also the idea of Rosie the Riveter. That during World War II, you guys that know your history, you know that, man, the women, they went to work in the mills. And, man, they went to work building the tanks and building the jeeps and building the airplanes. And they made a huge, gigantic difference in the effort of fighting against all the evil that was going on in World War II against the Nazi party. And so he decided, I want to kind of give Wonder Woman the same kind of feel as Rosie the Riveter. And so you, I can just see Rosie, man, give her a bing, bing, bing thing right there. She can, she can knock those bullets away, all right? So here's what I want you guys to do, this idea of, I don't know how many of you guys saw uh, the, the last Wonder Woman movie that came out. Any of you guys see that? Okay, I'm thinking some of you guys had to. It made billions of dollars, I'm pretty sure, okay? Uh, I'm going to show you a quick scene, and this scene is, is that she has, uh, she has uh, gotten together with some other soldiers, and they're trying to go stop the major bad guy, and along the way, they come across, the, the, the setting is in World War I, 
doesn't fit the history of Woman Woman. But anyways, uh, the setting of this movie is World War I, and the scene happens in no man's land. If you know much history about no man's land of World War I, that man, the Germans and the, 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 their enemies, we basically set up a cross from them for several years in an area called no man's land. This is an actual picture of what the no man's, would have, no man's land would have looked like. It was dead. There were no trees. There was no grass. What there was is there was 400 miles of trenches dug across. There was over 1 million miles of barbed wire. And there was three years of trench warfare where for three years both sides were basically stuck. Nobody could make it across no man's land. They were stuck in their trenches, not advancing, not getting anywhere. And so with that idea in mind, before we jump in and watch this clip, where or how long have you been stuck with something in your life? Where or how long have you been stuck with an addiction how long have you maybe not forgiven somebody? How long have you held on to some bitterness? How long has God been putting on your heart, I want you to make this change, but you're stuck in the trenches? Let's watch this clip and then we'll jump into our text. So, you guys didn't get to see all the cool parts. My video messed up there. But just even that short of a clip, I hope that stirs a little something inside of you. Like, yeah, you go, girl. That's right. What do you mean just sitting around doing nothing? You go make a difference. Well, it may sound funny, but I really think our biblical character this morning fits this story idea really well. Open up to Judges chapter 4. Judges chapter 4, verse 1. If you've ever read through the book of Judges, you know that Judges is a constant loop. That it is constantly the story of God's people, and it's the story of us that we have where God's people, they fall away from the Lord. They stop trusting Him, and when they stop trusting Him, God turns them over to their rebellion. And bad things, bad people start coming in, and finally they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord rescues them, and they're faithful to God again. And the whole thing just keeps happening, it's cycle after cycle. We see that even in verse 1 where it says, Again! The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, uh, that Ehud was dead. If you guys remember the story, the story of Ehud, that's a pretty funny story, actually. Uh, so the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. I'm going to be trying to act like I know how to say all these words this morning, very confidently and very fastly, okay? Uh, Sesera, the commander of his armies, was based in Harash Hagaman. Okay, now Sesera, he is the bad guy. As we go through the story, remember Sesera. We don't like Sesera. He's the bad guy. He's the the bad general here, okay? Verse 3, because Sesera, he had 900 chariots fitted with iron. In those days, if you had a chariot, it was the equivalent of an F-16. It was the equivalent of a tank. And man, God's people, they didn't have chariots. They maybe probably didn't even have weapons made of iron, much less chariots made of iron. And he had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. What is the thing in your life that's been oppressing you? For some of us, it may have been 20 weeks. could have been 20 months. For some of us, though, we've been stuck in something for over 20 years being harassed by that enemy of our life. So, uh, the Israelites, for 20 years, they, uh, they, carried, they cried out to the Lord for help. Now, Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Labadeth, was leading Israel at the time. Now, I underline that she's a prophet, that she's a wife. I underline leading there. The little, the little uh, footnote there says she was a judge. And there was some Deborah. I heard one uh, commentator talking about how Deborah is, in his opinion, the most interesting woman in the Old Testament. Here we have a photo of her. This is probably in the church bulletin, I'm sure, the picture she got, okay, for the church bulletin. All right. Uh, this is just a book that I grabbed talking about Deborah, the prophet, uh, the prophetess, okay. Deborah, as we read through the scripture, we find out that she is a mother. She's a wife. She's a judge. She's a leader of God's people. She's a prophetess. She teaches. She preaches. She instructs. She's a warrior. Here in a little bit, we're going to find out how she goes into battle with all the men. And then we're going to find out in verse 5, she's a poet. And she's a musician. That is a lot of amazing things for any one person to be in a lifetime, but especially for a woman to be during the days that Deborah is living. Because in those days, and especially in that part of the country, the only thing women were worth, the attitude was, was worth being a wife and a mother. That was their whole purpose. Take care of the home, take care of the kids. 
And one commentator, as I was reading, I love the quote, he said, Deborah said to herself, why should I be limited in what I can do and achieve when I serve a limitless God? Can I get an amen? amen. We serve a limitless God. But so many of us, I think, we get so busy and life gets so tiring at times and, and we, we get our focus on so many wrong things that I think sometimes we limit ourselves and how God can use us in powerful ways. So what limits do you set, set, set on yourself? The ones I'm about to share are ones that I've struggled with. I don't know if you've struggled with these ever, but here's the ones that I think of when I settle and I think God can't use me in certain ways. Here's the things that are behind it for me. One is comfort. I like being comfortable. I don't like feeling awkward. I don't like having to do things that are inconvenient for me. One is security. Man, we live in a world that is constantly telling us, you need to seek security. Security is the most important thing. How you lock up your house, how you have insurance for everything you own, how you have insurance in case you die, how you have insurance in case your spouse dies, how you have insurance in case you have a car wreck. You are, we are surrounded by people saying you need to make sure you are safe and secure in life. And the other one is the American dream. These are the things for me that I go, this is what's important in life. And I end up limiting what God can do in my life because I'm making these things my God rather than my God. So let me ask this of you. Why do we settle for such small, unabundant living? You remember Jesus said, I have come to give you life and give you life to the ab abundantly, to give you life to the full, to give you life, carpe diem. Why do we so often settle for so much less than the abundant living that God offers us. I think a couple of reasons. Again, this is for me. I'm too busy with what I think are more important things. My to-do list is the most important thing in the world. If I don't get my to-do list done, your lives will fall apart. Just watch. If I don't get my stuff done on my to-do list, everything's going to fall apart at work. Everything's going to fall apart at home. There might be a little bit of truth to that. Like, I don't know, paying bills, eating, breathing. Definitely keep those to-do lists going. But man, for me, so often my to-do list, I'm just too busy to do what I think God is calling me to do. I tend to think that it's somebody else's job. And this is just me being honest about myself. I recently met a young man who is homeless, that I can get in contact with this young man. I could spend time with this young man. And I, I'm just kind of going, well, I think they have ministers down at the homeless shelter. I, I mean, they're there with him. They can, they can reach out to that young man. Why, why, why should I take time to do that? And another reason for me has been because I'm afraid. I'm afraid maybe sometimes for my safety, but to be honest, mainly I'm afraid that it's going to be inconvenient and it's going to be messy. And so let's just, keep, let's just keep things. If things are going good, let's just keep things going good. There's nothing wrong with that. And without realizing it, I get stuck in no man's land. So Judges 4, verse 6, talking about Deborah, says she went to Barak. Barak, sorry, I'm going to get a Barak. Barak, okay, Barak is the good guy. Barak is the, the, the general over or God's, uh, God's armies here, okay? She went to Barak, son of Amdaphram, Kadesh, in Nephtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you go. I love that she says go because we have go in our vision statement, so I just think that's kind of fun, okay? All right? Go into our community seeking relationships through serving, okay? She says, The Lord is giving you, Barak, a command go. Take with you 10,000 men, Nephtali and Zebulun, and lead them to the Mount Tabor. I will lead Sesera, the commander of Jabin's army, with the chariots and his troops to Kishon River. Okay, we'll hear about the Kishon River more here in a minute. And give him into your hands. So God is saying through Deborah, the prophetess, she's preaching, she's teaching, she's speaking for God. And she says to, to Barak, here's the plan. You get your men together and go fight this battle. Go down to this, uh, this, this part of the, where, where this river is. This is where you're going to fight the battle and God's going to give you victory. And Barak's response is this. He said to Deborah, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go, I won't go. God has told, given him a command, go do this. But he's saying, well, I'm going to do it, but only on my conditions. I don't know if any of you guys know much about this animal. This is an Impala. Maybe some of you guys drive the Ford Impala. I don't know if it's a Ford or not. Okay, the Chevy. Okay. Impalas are really interesting animals. Okay? They're not the fastest animals out on the savannah, okay? out, on, out, in, out in Africa. They can run maybe about 40 miles an hour. 
But the impressive thing about Apollos is this, is that they can jump a distance of 30 to 35 feet in length. So if they come running up to a river, man, they don't have to go through the river. They can jump over the river. So their length is pretty impressive. And I like how they put the little fur out so it looks like they're trying to float longer or something like that. I don't know, okay. Uh, but the other thing that's probably even more impressive is they can jump some, over something that's 10 feet tall. 10 feet tall. And this is what they use to escape danger. This, this, not so much the speed, but being able to leap and be able to jump. Now, if you guys go to the Denver Zoo and you say, let's go look at the Impalas. They're so cute how they hop around like that. Let's go look at them. And you get there, you know what? You will not see them encaged with a moat that's 40 feet wide. There won't be a moat at all. You think, well, they can jump over something 10 feet high, so I guess they have an 11-foot fence. No, they won't have an 11-foot fence. They will have a 4-foot Solid brick fence surrounding the Impalas. And the Impalas will stay in that confinement with just a four-foot fence surrounding them. Why? They can leap over that with no problem. The reason they don't is because they will not jump over anything unless they can see what's on the other side and how they're going to land. Isn't that how we treat our God when he tells us to take a leap of faith? We feel like God puts something on our heart to do something. We go, well, I don't know. How's that going to work out for me? If I do that, this could go wrong. Man, I'm the, my wife is over there probably very spiritually rolling her eyes at me right now because I am so guilty of overthinking everything. But if we did that, I don't know, this could happen. That person might say that. What if these people did that? And I overthink when God is telling me to do something. I try to figure it all out. I try to use my reasoning, my logic, because God obviously needs my help in those decisions in life, right? They won't jump over things until they know how it's going to be on the other side of that thing. And that's what Barak is saying. He's saying, I'll go, but I'm only going to go if it goes the way I want it to go. You have to come with me, Deborah. It's circumstantial obedience. Actually, circumstantial disobedience might also be a good definition. That he's saying, I, okay, God has given me a command to go, but I'm not going to do what God is telling me to do. I'm not going to go unless he does it the way that I want it to be done. And we can end up getting stuck in our lives for years and years and years because God may have already told you how to get unstuck. God may have told you, you want to get over this thing in life? Here's the hard thing you have to do. And I, and you most likely, we are so guilty of going, no, nope, I'm not going to do it the way you want me to do it. We're going to do it on my terms. So, Deb, Deb, we're close friends, Deb. That's why I'm called Deborah Deb. Me and Deb are close. So, so Deb here, Deborah. She's a good woman. She's a good friend. She says, certainly I will go, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sesra into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kedesh. Now here, I always thought that she was saying, because you're not doing what God said to do, the glory isn't going to go to you. The glory is going to go to me, Deborah. And it actually turns out the glory doesn't go to Deborah. The glory goes to another woman. If you guys will later on check down at the end of uh, chapter 4, you'll hear how the king, how that general actually was taken out and killed by the woman Jael, Hebrew's wife. Hebron's wife. I'm saying that wrong. Just, get, just move along. All right. So Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sesera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went, Barak went down to Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sesera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sesera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Now we're kind of like, well, this, is, this, is a, this is not a very good description of how the battle went down. And we're going to see in the next chapter, chapter 5 here in a minute, we get a couple of things filled on, on how this battle happened. But I love that it says at Barak's advance, as he said, the general said, charge that the Lord is the one who routed the enemy. It wasn't. Barak. It was the Lord. And it says that the, the general Sesra, he had to get out of his chariot and flee on foot. Well, why in the world would he get out of his chariot? Well, here's the thing. Chariots, they're no good over in the, the foothills. You don't want to have a battle over the foothills with a chariot. That's not going to work. You got all these rocks. They're not good in the forest. You can't get around trees. They're good out in the plains, kind of like where a river might run through. 
You can get out of the planes and you can ride fast in that chariot and you can take people out. And so we see in chapter 5, chapter 5, we get to hear how some of the battle played out. We also get to hear Deborah. She begins to praise the people who showed up to help fight the battle. And it's also, it's, it's information how they won the battle. It's praise for those who fought. And it's also a roast for the people that didn't show up for the battle. Let's take a look at chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 4. It says, When you, Lord, went out from Syria, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water. The emphasis isn't on what uh, Barak did. The emphasis is on how when God showed up and what God did. And apparently, the clouds poured down water. And we read in verse 21, the river Kishon swept them away. That old, the age-old river, the river Kishon. March on, my soul. Be strong. If we're trying to fill in the blanks, the best that we can tell what's going on is that they ran down with these chariots out in that big field that God had it rain so much that maybe the chariots bottomed out. Maybe it got so muddy that their tires sank down that as they tried to cross that river, God used the power of the river to wash his enemies away. What an awesome story. God is the one doing the fighting. I hope that makes you go... Whew! I don't have to fight the bad guy. God is willing to fight the bad guy for me. We go on that she begins to tell people thank you who showed up for the fight. The remnant of the nobles came down. The people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty. And she talks about the different people, Ephraim and Benjamin and the prince of Issachar and the people of Zebulun and Nephtal. She's saying you guys all showed up and you helped fight the battle. But in 16 and 17, she doesn't say thank you. In 16 and 17... She decides to explain the people who didn't show up. Really quick, Brian, where you, what mountain is this, Brian? What do you think? <laughs> it's Mount Denali in Alaska. Okay, tallest mountain we have here in the United States. Yeah, there you go. Brian remembers. Tammy and I just got to go to Alaska, and I love the mountains. I love watching documentaries and listening to books about people who've climbed Everest and K2 and Denali and that kind of stuff. And we got to go, and we got to see Denali. And our bus guide, he was funny. He was like, people ask me all the time, as we're driving, you see all these mountains everywhere. And people say, how will we know which one is Denali? And he goes, trust me. You will know when you see it. The, the green mountains there in front of all the snow caps, those are 14,000 foot peaks. That's Mount Elbert, as tall as we get here in Colorado. And man, Denali towers over it. Well, because I enjoyed that, my wife is awesome. She knows I love that. So for our 25th anniversary, she said, let's get you to Alaska. And man, we're going through Denali Park and, and we're reading about different people who climbed. Uh, the, actually, some people took a, 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 a dog sled team to the top of Denali. Okay? But then people also want to be the first person to climb Denali solo, doing it all by yourself. Well, I wanted to find out who got the first solo climb in. Well, it turns out this guy by the name of Frederick Cook is the one who gets to claim that he soloed not only only Denali, the first person to do it, but also the North Pole. And we saw a plaque that said, Frederick Cook, if he were alive today, his Twitter, Twitter bio would read that he's a doctor. That's impressive. He graduated from med school. Okay, a smart, intelligent, disciplined man. Photographer, when he went on these adventures. Back in the day when photography wasn't just pull out your cell phone, okay? Uh, you actually had to carry a gigantic box with you, bird box and black powder and all sorts. He was a photographer. He was an explorer, a mountaineer, a motivational speaker. Well, I hope to motivate when I speak sometimes. This guy is my kind of guy. This guy is awesome. And, and they had a picture of here he is. I mean, first of all, look at that beard. Look at that outfit. That is, man, that's, that's a good looking man right there. Okay, Here's a picture of him on top of Mount Denali that he turned into all the magazines and the newspaper. And people began to praise him saying, this guy is amazing. Dr. Cook, first solo summit. The only problem is the picture that he took, he cropped to the sides. You can see the little dots right there. The reason he cropped the sides is because if this is a very good picture, but if you look closely on the original, you can see higher peaks on the left and the right of where he's standing. And as they started digging through some of his older photos that he took on the same day, I guess because of the time stamp, you know, and those kind of pictures, that here's another picture that he took. And you can see, obviously, there's a much higher peak further up. Turns out he never even came close to summoning. Denali. The whole thing was a hoax. 
He had set the whole thing. Matter of fact, they figured out this little spot right here. I know you can't see that, but where that little circle is, that's where he took the picture. It's like below 14,000 feet. He just thought, if I get the camera set just right and, just, and everything, this kind of looks like the top. And so the whole thing was a hoax. So it says, if you were to read his Twitter feed, he's a doctor, he's a mountaineer, he's a motivational speaker, and he's a con man. He never showed up. But he claimed that he had. And I was sitting there reading about Frederick Cook thinking, this poor guy, I mean, he's getting what he deserves. I mean, he should have definitely been shamed back in his day. But it's like a hundred years later. And I'm standing here looking at, they have a huge sign saying, Frederick Cook is a liar. Frederick Cook is a con man. He never showed up. And I'm thinking his great-great-grandchildren are like, let's go see Denali. Oh, our great-great-grandfather was a, never showed up. Never did what he said he was going to do. Hundreds of years later, thousands of years from now, he is going to be shamed for not showing up. And that's what's going on in verses 16 and 17. That Deborah says, thank you, those who showed up to help the Lord fight in this battle. But in 16 and 17, she begins to mock and make fun of those who didn't show up. Reuben, why did you stay among the sheep pens to hear the whistling for the flocks? Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he linger by the ships? We're out here fighting out in the plains and he's hanging out by the ships. Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his coves. And then probably the worst rebuke, the worst roast of all of them is verse 23 where it says, Curse Miraz. The angel of the Lord. If you guys know anything about the angel of the Lord, this is a big insult. The angel of the Lord curse its people bitterly. Why curse Miraz? Because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. Here's what I love about the story. Did they win the battle? Did the army win the battle? No, God won it for them, obviously. But it's saying that God still wanted them to show up to help, that they were part of the plan. God wants to use us to make great things happen. He can do it on his own, but he wants to use the least of these, the underdogs, Small little churches, maybe. Broken people from bo broken backgrounds. That's who he wants to use to make a difference in the world. But we have to be willing to show up. Now, here's what we're going to do to finish up this morning. I'm going to share a couple of scriptures, and then I'm going to... Nah, I'm just going to share a couple of scriptures. We'll end with that. And, and, and I feel like I can be so guilty of extremes sometimes. I feel like sometimes, I feel like I get up here and I want to preach grace. I want to preach big, huge grace. Because that's God-sized grace. It is big. It is huge. But sometimes I think if all we ever do is only preach grace and only preach how God loves us and how God has taken away our sins, what we end up doing is we forget the other truth. The other truth that, yes, He has forgiven us our sins, but He still calls us to live a certain way way. And if we're not careful, I never want to swing the other direction and say, you're showing up and your good deeds is what saves you. That is spitting on the cross. If you believe at all that you're just a good person, you do good things, and when God shows up, he's going to take you to heaven because you've done good things. You are spitting on Jesus on the cross saying, that doesn't do it for me. I'll take care of this myself. And so I don't believe that we ever do anything to earn our salvation. I love what Ephesians 2 says. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not from yourself. It's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. I don't believe that, I'm going through puberty as I talk there, I don't believe that we do things and it makes God love us more. I don't think God says work hard so you can be saved. We don't serve to be saved. Amen? We serve because that is what the one who saved us did and what he has called us to do. That's why we serve. I love that I've told you guys before, on a scale of 1 to 10, I think Jesus loves you in 11. And you know what? If you serve somebody every day, if you do great, wonderful things and, and help the needy and, and help your neighbors, and, and all that, God doesn't look down at you and go, oh, I used to love you in 11, but now you've done so many good things, I love you at 12. No, that isn't how grace works. The reason we serve is so those who don't know the Lord 
can see how you love them and how you serve them, and they end up falling in love with the Lord. So as we finish up this morning, instead of me preaching, instead of me trying to convince anybody of anything, I just want to read several scriptures. I don't have time to lay out the, I'm not going to preach them. I'm not going to explain them. I'm not going to lay out the context. You may get some of these. You may not get some of these because of the context. That's okay. But I just want to finish this morning letting the Spirit speak to our hearts in saying, are you showing up? Are you being obedient to what God is calling you to do? When he says, go, do you go? Faith and deeds. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, it's dead. For we are God's workmanship. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. And if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with mere words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices, those are pleasing to God. Then the man who had received the one bag of gold came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I, I was afraid. And I went out, and I hid. I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus, he said, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothing, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty and a stranger needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the one of the least of these, you didn't do it for me. Then they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. We do not serve to be saved. God has called us to serve because that's what the one who is saved did for us and has called us to do. Not to earn his favor, but to have others fall more in love with him. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you this morning, Lord, and we ask that you would please wake us up. Help us not just be comfortable with thinking, okay, man, I've just, I, I've got to pay bills. I've just got to survive. I just got to get through life. And then, and then if I can make it to church on Sunday, well, then there, there's, that my, there's my gift to God. That's my service is by sitting somewhere. Lord, we are surrounded every day by people who are hurt in our offices, by people who are hurt at our jobs. 
Father, we know family members that they, 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 they need support, they need encouragement. Father, we drive past places and people and opportunities constantly thinking, I've got to get on to my important to-do list. Lord, forgive us of that. Wake us up, and I pray that there will never be a day, please, Lord, never be a day where somebody will say, Boulder Valley Church of Christ, why did you stay inside your doors? Why did you stay inside your walls? Why did you not show up to love the hurting and the needy around you? Don't let us be people who are stuck. Let us be people who move forward because of your son. We love you, and we ask these things in your son's name. And the church says, let's stand and sing.